So, um, hi, welcome. This is the 291st meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. That's a weekly lecture series about comics, illustration, animation, and the history of all these text image works. We're sponsored in part uh, by the Will and Ann Eisner Family Foundation. Our guest tonight is Sharon Rudall. She's been a political activist since her teenage years. She studied uh, art at Cooper Union in New York City and lives down in the East Village. Um, it, her biography mentions that proceeds from her feminist erotic novel, Acid Temple Ball, paid for her art supplies and rent. After college, she helped start the anti-Vietnam War underground newspaper Takeover that was in Madison, Wisconsin. She worked on underground newspapers in San Francisco in the early 70s and began drawing comics in the first women's comic, comics. Her first major works include a Dangerous Woman, the graphic biography of Emma Goldman, The Adventures of Crystal Knight, uh, it was reprinted in the Abrams Art in Time book, and she collaborated with Paul Buell on several books, Lincoln for Beginners, and she drew large portions of the graphic version of Studs Terkel's working. She also um, did the comics for Harvey Picar and Paul Buell's Yiddish Kite and the book Bohemians. Tonight, Sharon is here to talk about her latest book, Ballad of an American. That's a graphic biography of Paul Robeson. So hold on one second. I'm going to um, hold on one second. There's just a few late comers. I wanted to get into the audience. Okay, so I'm going to run the slideshow. Okay. Let me just say hi before we start this. Oh, one. yeah. Oh, okay. You can... <laughs> this Go is ahead. Sharon Rudolph in Los Angeles. Um, when I agreed to do this talk, it was I guess the beginning of the summer, and I thought by the time I would be speaking to you that the pandemic and the election would be in the rearview mirror, but apparently not. We're still in the thick of everything, but uh, that makes what I have to say no, no less relevant. And I, I'd like to begin with uh, reading a few pages as just sort of an introduction to my, my life and work. Can you roll the first slide then? Sure. Hold on. Hold on, let me just try one thing. That's it. Can you blow, make it bigger so people can see it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to read these because it's too hard to read the screen, especially with our eyes the way they are. In 1963, when I was 16, I took the bus from Maryland to march with Martin Luther King. And the story is called Two Marches. It was commissioned shortly after uh, Trump's inauguration. When I was almost 70, I joined the anti-Trump Women's March in DC. The triumphant I Have a Dream March came after years of more dangerous ones. Redneck Capitol Police beat and arrested demonstrators, roughing them up in jail. They tortured people in jail back then. Kids like me marched in front, brandishing our songs as shields. Ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. My one regret about the 1963 march I didn't know Josephine Baker was there, one of many elegant, proud older ladies. She might have walked beside me. What I liked best, at the end of the route, we bathed our sore feet in the reflecting pool in front of the Lincoln Memorial, and Martin Luther is, King is giving the I Red Dream speech. For a few hours, the nation's capital belonged to us. But more than half a century later, even to defy Trump, I had trouble convincing myself to book a flight from Los Angeles to DC. I'm talking to my sons in the kitchen. I'm tired, I'm cranky. What if I lose my temper with the security guards? 
don't worry, mom, we'll come visit you in Guantanamo Bay, an actual quote from, from younger son. LAX agents did peg me as a danger to the state. They felt me up carefully and tested my hands for explosives residue. But I'm thinking, but look at all the sisters in pink pussy hats. I stayed with old friends, one I hadn't seen for 30 years. Oh, we need the next, the next slide. That's the third one. No, we need, we need slide number two. Yeah, that's it, that's oh, okay. it. I stayed with old friends, one I hadn't seen for 30 years. Maryland Congressman Steny Hoyer hired buses to transport us from a neighborhood church. Supporters who couldn't march left sandwiches and water. People of all ages and ethnic origins poured into DC to oppose Trump. The overwhelmed police pulled back to defend the White House and Trump's international hotel. My cartoon sign was much admired and photographed. My sign was grabbing by the balls with a, a cartoon image of the same. We couldn't see or hear the famous speakers reach food vendors or access porta potties. I relieved my bladder on piles of straw, thoughtfully left for the police horses. Just hold my coat up, Becky, I'm, I'm asking everybody. What was the same at the two marches? We all behaved like citizens of the nation we wanted to become. The um, person that's guarding the subway says, all rides free today, ladies. And some women say, try some of our homemade biscotti. And people are helping us, a woman in a wheelchair. Let me lift you over this steep curb. Even when too pa tightly packed to move, we felt completely safe. It seemed we each cradled the tiny flame. We would on no account allow to blow out. Okay, so I was gonna read that story, and then uh, this summer I felt like I couldn't read that story without adding something. So although I very rarely work without uh, a deadline and a commission and so forth, I did a last page, more marches. And now we, yeah, there it is. And you see signs, justice for George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Elijah McClain, Black Lives Matter, et cetera. Early in Trump's last year, a new virus spread from a Wuhan meat market to engulf the world. Cities fell silent. Skies were smog-free. Swans swam in the Venice canals. But soon, hopes for cosmic justice faded. Suffering and death fell on the usual victims. Low-wage workers serving those who could afford isolation. The spark of yet another police murder of a black man set off from death, not seen in half a century. I watched on TV as mass rebels crashed Beverly Hills boutiques and upscale shopping malls. A few days later, I heard the voices of old comrades. And in the distance, you see people saying, chanting, power to the people, power to the people. And I'm thinking, too much time home alone. I must be hallucinating. A big demo on Hollywood Boulevard had turned and was passing half a block from my house. I grabbed my bandana and hurried to join in, stumping along, chanting. Young marchers gave me water and an embroidered mask to be continued. And I'm putting up a banner that says, the police are the food of the rich, which comes from a, a Mexican play I saw when one of my sons was a toddler. Okay, so that's me, that's my life. And now we can move on to slide number four. Now these slides are gonna be just stuff in sequential storytelling with art that had really influenced me and that I really love or that I really think is relevant. I love cave art, maybe because I started my artistic career drawing on the walls of my bedroom, drawing horses and dogs on the wall of my bedroom. But it also seems to me we don't give this as an art school enough credit. Nobody just picks up a burn stick and starts drawing like this. It takes many, many years and probably an apprenticeship and a training period. And art in the historic world rarely has reached this point in de depicting animals. Only, I think, Chinese and Japanese art come close to what the cave art has achieved. I also feel that cave art is the purest form of what I always looked for in art that seemed so absent in the New York City art world, which seemed to be all about you know, coming up with some shtick that rich people could bid on as though it was an IPO on the stock market. Uh, the cave warriors were about something else entirely. I, I don't pretend to know what it was, but it's important to me. Next slide. I'm moving right along. This is an illuminated manuscript. These were objects of value to rich people, but they were a lot like comic books. They were little books you could hold in your hand that were illustrated, that told stories usually from the gospels or the lives of saints. And they're, they're packed full of information. And they're, they're, this is a really particularly beautiful and sophisticated one, but there were much simpler ones that were made um, in monasteries and such. I think this is the Lambour brothers. And 
one of the reasons this comes up for me is that I have a distinct memory of when I was in high school, I guess just about the same time I was starting to demonstrate. I always knew I would be some kind of an artist and I thought what I would really like to be is a monk who illustrated um, these illuminated manuscripts, which considering I was a dumpy little Jewish girl in suburban Maryland, seemed like a very unlikely career objective. But when I was working on the Robeson book, I got like sort of a flashback that's what I was doing. I was, in fact, you know, illuminating the life of a, of a progressive saint in very much the spirit that I had imagined the monks making these, these works. Okay, and on to the, the sixth slide, please. This is Daumier, um, a French um, cartoonist, um, panel cartoonist for magazines and such. He did the famous one of, of Zola saying Jacques I accused uh, in court about the, the anti-Semitic Dreyfus affair. He's a master to anyone who wants to use their line to, to tell stories or to display social idiosyncras idiosyncrasies. He's, he's the ultimate in cartoon art, in my opinion. This is uh, Bismarck's dream. In Bismarck's nightmare, he's seeing the field of all the people killed by his wars. Uh, next, next slide, number seven. This is Kathy Kolwitz. If you don't know her work, I, I commend it to you. Um, she was a political artist in Germany, um, mostly before Hitler. She was an old, old lady by the time Hitler came along. Uh, her work is very powerful. And my favorite Kathy Kolwitz anecdote is one of her etchings, that the lines are particularly deep carved and dark because she went into labor with one of her children while her while her her work was in the etching bath and had to be left and so she came back and rescued it so it has particularly dark and dramatic lines next etching i mean next next uh, Okay, Diego Rivera, all progressive artists must revere Diego Rivera. This is a particularly charming one because I don't know if you can see Frida Kahlo is handing out uh, rifles to the revolutionaries. And uh, so it's a particularly inspiring one. I could never be a muralist, I can't stand on ladders and I think small rather than think big, but the Mexican muralists are an inspiration to us all. Uh, next, number nine. This is Thomas Hart Benton, uh, um, mostly pre, mid-century American artist. I love his work. Um, it's expressionist in the way the forms are twisted and moved by the emotions of the artist, but unlike, and the colors are expressionist colors, but somehow it's very, it's very American. I didn't appreciate American art when I was growing up as, as a, in my, you know, second century of life, I appreciate it more and more when I'm looking for references and when I'm looking for stuff that moves me. I, I really love this, but instead of it coming out sounding like um, Kurt Weill, it, it sounds like uh, uh, Appalachian fiddle music. It's, it's it, as, as Paul Robeson is a ballad of American, this is also a ballad a ballad of America in, in visual form. Um, and on to number 10, Fritz Eichenberg. Next slide. Okay, this guy, I actually don't know much about him, but he illustrated sort of inexpensive but deluxe editions of classics that working class people and immigrants who wanted culture in their homes were able to buy in, in the mid-century. And my parents had some of his books around the house. This, I believe, is from Wuthering Heights. And my anecdote about myself that I remember about this is I used to pour over these books before I could read. And then when I could read and I read, there's no doubt Wuthering Heights is a wonderful and powerful book. I was disappointed because the stories that Fritz Eichenberg's uh, woodlock woodcuts told in my mind were even stronger and more powerful and more dramatic and more overwhelming than, than the stories and the words. Um, so this is, this is a hallmark of something I come back to of, of what I want to do. All right, and on to something much lighter. Um, next slide, Tibor Gergely. Tibor Gergely is an artist I only discovered when I was a mother and I had, couldn't afford to buy new books for my children, so I used to buy things at yard sales. He came from, he was an immigrant um, from Hungary in post-World War II era, must have been a very progressive person from the uh, things that I'll explain in some of his work, but he also has a very expressionist palette and the way he distorts forms, but again, in, somehow in a jolly enough way that they made it into little golden books and he was able to support himself. The first one we read was called The Happy Man his dump truck and the happy man was unshaved and his buddy was a wino and the animals all looked like they came out of George Orwell and it was just wonderful and I loved it. On to the next and last keyboard gurgling. Next slide. Okay, so 
I always turn to my Tibor Grigoli collection when I need to draw a group scene or see new people working. But one of the most amazing things about him for the period, he has black people. In his hospital, he has black doctors, he has black lab workers. When he shows a city street scene, he shows black people going about their business in an ordinary way, not caricatured or exaggerated in any way, just as part of life. You don't see that in any other 1950s little folding book. I mean, you don't see Jewish people or Italian people. God forbid you should see black people. In Tibor Grigoli, you see everybody as well as him being a wonderful artist. And uh, over the years, I've acquired a pretty good collection. And I turn to it again and again uh, as a reference. Okay, and that's the artists that, I, that in most inspire me, not that there's not lots of others. So now we're gonna move on to some of my work. Um, the next three slides, you can show them just next, Dubova, page one. This was one of my first serious works. This is when underground comics were getting started. And what did I do as an underground comic? A story about my grandmother immigrating from Russia. So uh, underground comics was, that became graphic novels, it was using a form that had been around for a while, but it was using it, it filling it with a kind of content that had never been used for sequential art before, at least not that I was familiar with. It gave me a form in which I could do what I'd always wanted to do. Uh, and this is one of the first works that I think uh, really explores what I, what I wanted to do as an artist. You can show the next, the next two pages, Tibuba 2 and Tibuba 3. This is based on an actual anecdote. My my bubby stole a fish. She girls weren't supposed to learn to read. Her her father was a rabbi, and girls weren't supposed to be learned to read in those days. So she, she stole a fish and took it to another rabbi to be to learn to read. Is is someone trying to talk to me? Yeah. Could could I ask everyone to mute themselves, please? I'd be happy somebody. to talk to you later. I will talk to you later. Okay, that's Jibuba. And now we can go on to Emma Goldman cover. Yeah, there she goes. She went she's, she, here I'm sort of making, adding to the story a little bit, adding a revolutionary romance that may or may not have occurred. In Jibuba 3, next slide. Next slide, Dan. Oh, okay. So this is Emma Goldman, the cover of the Emma Goldman, A Dangerous Woman. And I, I, I still, it's not out of print. We still, I still get a few royalties every year. And you could probably get it from the library or get it secondhand. I commend it to you. Let's see if we have any other Emma Goldman. Oh, I have the last page. Next slide is the last page of Emma Goldman. Okay, and we see her from a child growing into a, a woman activist. And I don't know if you can see the influence of the Kathy Colwitz style there. I did a little bit of that. Okay, and now I think the next one is the cover of the Lincoln book. If you want to, can we move on to the next yeah, slide? I'm just trying to find out where that sound is coming from. Wait, okay. Whoops, sorry. Uh oh, I think I muted you. Hold on. Sorry. Try to unmute yourself. Wait. Did you try to unmute yourself? I'm having trouble unmuting you for some reason. I unmuted myself. Oh, great, to, great. Go ahead. To any and all, I, I don't even know how to turn the computer on, and this is my first attempt at zooming. So please bear oh, with me. Sorry. I just unmuted myself all by myself. Oh, and this that's Lincoln from the Lincoln book. Um, Okay, that's the cover. I just wanted to say something about, about it that I've got a lot of biographies because of the jobs that were given to me. I would never have chosen to do biographies, but there's always a lot to learn. And, and living in LA and Hollywood, as a matter of fact, it's a little like being an actor when you do an, a biography. You have to find a place where the character and you can, can join. And Lincoln was an awfully hard one, but the th place where I sort of linked up with Lincoln was his self-education and his passion for learning is a place where I could, where I could feel that there was some sort of connection between us. Okay, next next page of the Lincoln. This is the night of the Emancipation Proclamation with the uh, slaves that have heard by word of mouth what's going to happen. They're they're waiting for midnight when they when they'll become free. I think that's the end of Lincoln. Okay, next. This was a cover for a Jewish uh, academic. 
publication, an interdisciplinary journal of Jewish studies for their Passover edition. And Moses is saying, let my planet go in the midst of ecological disasters, polar bears and uh, immigrants traveling on boats. And I like this one. But anyways, I thought I would share it with you. And next. Oh, now we move on. Okay, so this is the book. This is the, the Robeson book. And uh, it's for sale. And uh, But you can also order from a library, I bet. So again, I hope you'll have a chance to read it. Um, and now on to the Robeson portrait. I think that should be the next one, the portrait I painted of Robeson. Yeah, and there's a portrait of Robeson. Notice that the Van Gogh swirls of light because he did he did become somewhat mentally unstable in late life and uh, I wanted and the glare of of publicity brought it was part of what brought him uh, to lots of disastrous conclusions so I that's what I was trying to express in that painting not altogether successfully but that's what I was aiming at okay and I'm going to read you a short part of the Robeson we can move on to the next slide now. All right, this is the last thing I'm gonna read and, and bother you with. But, okay, so when I was working on the Robeson, it was very, I was trying to figure out how did he go from being just a very famous athlete and entertainer to being such a committed activist. He was always progressive in some ways, but he believed that, you know, as long as he and other blacks um, made much of their own lives, that then he, he would, find progress for his race that way. And then at some point he really became a committed revolutionary. So I felt like I almost had to make up a story. And this is based on just what was actually a footnote in the academic book by Professor Duberman that was, is like the main reference. So I wanna read this to you because I really like it. All right, so I'll tell you when to switch the page, but the, this is the first page. In 1928, Paul Robeson joined a demonstration of Welsh miners in central London. What's going on here? Paul Robeson asks. It's those Welsh miners again. So he was hanging out in England with people like H.G. Wells and, and the progressive uh, people in Parliament and stuff. They tried to form a union and the owners locked them out. And we see the marchers coming forward with, with signs in Welsh. And Robeson asks, shouldn't you Labour MPs, Labour members of Parliament, be doing something about that? Sorry, old chap. We keep our seats thanks to the English miners. That's something else I just made up and nobody's questioned it, but that's so much the way politics works, you know? I mean, the people that actually would get voted in would just worry about their own constituents as we see with uh, what's going on in the Senate nowadays. Okay, and Paul Robeson says, I'd like to check this out, meet you for cocktails later. So Paul Robeson goes over to talk to the, to the Welsh miners. Many of the miners spoke Welsh, but a student organizer eagerly answered Paul's questions. Next slide, please. The Welsh miners were the blackest white men Paul had ever met. Not only were the miners' skins blackened by coal, but they did the hardest, most dangerous work for low wages. Their children often went hungry and had no decent schools or medical care. The miners worked without safety gear and died young. Their sons followed them into the mines, while the mine owners and their stockholders got richer day by day. Next, next page. And Paul's back in a hotel room with his wife, Islanda, and he's, he's thinking, what if behind the thug mobs of racism, there were more powerful mob bosses, gang lords who stirred up and took advantage of racism? As long as working people could be divided by fear and hatred, blinded to their true enemies, the gang bosses would feast in peace on the lives of the poor. So that's pretty much what I had to say. And, uh, it seems like a really important message for the situation we find ourselves in. This is the beginning of the last chapter, and it uh, seems like a good summation to where all progressives find themselves after four years of Trump, bloodied but unbowed. You see the little John Henry image um, that we, we just have to keep lifting that, that hammer and hitting that nail and you, know, you can't give up. And uh, Paul Robeson was the exemplar of that. And I hope my book will inspire other people. And I would just like to end, um, with a quote from Ai Weiwei, another great international artist. This is what he has to say, quote, as an artist, my true struggle is to answer the call of the moment, to respond with my effort and become part of it. And that's what I have to say. And now anyone that wants to ask me questions or discuss anything, I'm, I'm available. All right, great. So, is that okay, uh, Ben? Yeah, that's great. So you can um, put your, um, questions in the um, chat and I'll either try to unmute you uh, 
or you can um, just write something. Or I can read you more stories from the books. Okay. I, had a, I had a question. How did you get involved in making comics? And was that something you were doing at Cooper Union? or is that? I tried to do, at Cooper Union, I remember one of my painting teachers was someone who was like recently anointed as the hottest thing in the gallery scene. And what he did was he did like traffic lane stripes. And he used to come over and look at my paintings for the figure and say, gee, that's great. I never could paint the figure. It was very disappointing. I never could draw people, something like that. Paint the figure would be too sophisticated to say. And, and, and another painting teacher said, why would would you want to paint like Velasquez? <laughs> well, I couldn't begin to explain it to you, but I want to. You know, it was everything. It was like black canvases and white canvases, and sculpture was was uh, metal cubes, and it wasn't at all what the cave artists did. It was very. I it, I had to go through a lot to get in and have enough money to leave home and you know do the whole thing. And I I really wanted. I will go to a real art school. I will become an artist. And what I found was very unsatisfying. Um, so. What happened was when I graduated with reasonably good grades, but they told, oh, here's another thing. They said, they said uh, graduate, you can't go to graduate school as a woman in the arts and, and they, won't, they won't take you, there won't be any future for you. And the painting teacher that, an Italian painting teacher that did like my painting said uh, that if I wasn't a girl, I would have been his apprentice, but because I would just get married, I couldn't be an apprentice. So I graduated and was very much at loose ends, but I went to Wisconsin because my first husband that I got the name Rudolph from, uh, some well-paid grant to study information theory or something came through and it seemed very strange to us to go to Wisconsin. It, it seemed like we'd be living in domes on Jupiter or something but I ended up on uh, having a very good experience there and I was recruited by Wisconsin radicals to do uh, getting people out of jail posters, Dana, Dana Beal in point and I loved doing that and then my radical friends wanted to start a newspaper and they said you will be our art department. I love doing that and I started doing just like single panel cartoons to get people out of jail or tell people about demonstrations things like that and then when I went to San Francisco and started working on the good times um, there were there was a cartoonist on staff, Guy Caldwell, and I used to just like stand behind his drafting table and watch him draw cartoons and think, gee, that's great. I could never do that. I can't do that. And I think my very first panel cartoon was about Nixon getting reelected, and it was people making a Nazi salute and shouted, saying, four more years, four more years, which seems really pressing and considering what's going on right now. And but even so, I still didn't think of myself as a cartoonist or cartooning being something that was accessible to me. And then that was just about when the left-wing radical anti-war movement was really falling apart. The Panthers were being shot. The, the white students were starting to study for business administration or buy real estate or something. Um, nobody was buying newspapers or comics anymore. And our newspaper was going to shut down. And just while it was starting to fall apart, Trina Robbins came and said, I want to put together a comic with women cartoonists. Is anyone here an artist? That would be willing to draw comics. I'll do it. I'll do it. And that that that's how I started. And I've never looked back because this does seem this is the painting on walls that I was looking for ever since I was okay. This this works for me. I don't know if it works for my readers. They might be upset that they have to go through all this stuff. But this this is what I this is what I'm meant to be doing. I have no doubt about that. Telling stories with telling stories to tell uh, through pictures that also have some sort of meaning to me that actually tried to touch people's hearts and make them look at things in a different way. Not just make them laugh or whatever, be aroused. I have nothing against doing things to make people laugh or make them be sexually aroused, but this is, this is, it's, this is something different I'm working at. It is, it's a religious art form for me. All right, there's a question from David Lasky. I don't, oh, sorry, I think I muted you. Hold on. Okay, go ahead. Hi, Sharon. Thank Hi. you for the presentation. And I'm, I really loved seeing the pages of the grandmother, and I'm curious where it first appeared and has it been reprinted? Do you have like a career retrospective kind of book? I don't, and people have sometimes suggested it, and I'm afraid I haven't been very uh, forthcoming about it because I, what I always really want is a deadline to do something new rather than put together things that are old. But Die Bube is probably my most reprinted story. It's been reprinted in uh, Sweden and France and Germany and uh, 
in a number of different books in the in the United States. That that probably is the most reprinted story I ever had. If you look it up online, you can probably find someplace that you can get it. But it was first, I think, just in a women's comic, and then it was in um, Marvel Comics had a brief flyer if they decided underground comics was going to be a way they make money. So they put out, I think it was four or five of these comics books, and they paid us a hitherto unheard of fee of $100 a page. And, uh, and it, it appeared in that, and, it, and I got my $100 a page, which was about four months' rent for me at the time. I think my rent was $35 a month at the time, actually. <laughs> so $100 a page was a princely sum, what can I say? There's a question from Nick. If I can, if you want to ask that. Um, hi, Sharon. Uh, did I unmute? Yes, yes. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to know when you were in Madison. I think I'm. That's where I went to college, and I think I just missed you. I worked okay. on another one paper, um, and I wondered if that was where you met Paul Buell. Um, I actually I never physically met Paul Buell, in spite of the fact that I'm probably the main artist he's worked with for some years now. Um, he was familiar with my work way back when and asked me to be in a couple things, and then. I'm trying to think. It was his book about the IWW, the International Workers of the World. I did a short piece about Emma Goldman. And when I was talking to him about it, I said on the phone, I said, you know, she deserves a whole book. And that apparently touched a chord and he did what was necessary to put the deal together. But we've never actually met in person. We came close to it a couple of times, but it's never happened. So it's just actually been through work. Um, <clears throat> I did a story for that book about, um, the cartoonist Ernest Reeb, the IWW cartoonist. Excuse me? I did a, a story for that book, for the IWW anthology about our Ernest Reeb. Okay. Is this Nick Torkelson? Yes. Oh, hi, Nick. I hi, never sir. met you either. Uh, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm about halfway through the second page of the, the Guinevere, and she's really looking beautiful. And you should see the horse. So I should be able to send you something in a couple of weeks. Oh, let me just tell you this project I'm working on with Nick. It's his book. It's about William Morris who was a socialist as well as a person that designed incredible craftsman furniture and wallpaper and stuff. And uh, mostly because of having too much pandemic time on my hands, I, I nag my way into being able to do 10 pages in it. And this is, this is a real, you know, a, a gift to myself to do something that, that's pretty rather than something that looks like expressionist woodcut. So I'm working in color and I'm doing all the vines and flowers and bunnies and birds and beautiful maidens. And it's been fun. It's been really a nice refreshing. It's hard too though, because no, I haven't done it, but, I, but it's been a very refreshing change for me. Can't wait to see you then, sir. There's a question from Roger Thornhill. Hi. Uh, I that's not my real name. Oh, okay. Right. I'm uh, Dan Theodore, and uh, I'm called. I'm here in Peekskill, New York, where Paul Robeson's appearance caused a riot. So I was going to ask if that's covered in your book. It is covered in the book, oh, and that's very exciting that you were there for it. Want me to read? I'm I there for it. I'm I'm not that old yet, but my <laughs> mother-in-law, who also was March at the march in Washington, you mentioned earlier, was there, uh -huh. and one of my friends. Uh, Paul Robeson stayed at his house in Peekskill here before the. Wow, uh, that's exciting. But Let's I'm, see if I can, I'm going to look and see if I can find the, the Peekskill part. I see Jason has the comics book out. Okay, here we go. Okay, so I, at this point, at the point that I got to that in this story, I was experiencing something that I'm sure Nick and, and, and other cartoonists are familiar with of my deadline is approaching. I still have a lot of material to cover. How am I going to cram this all in? So I actually tried to do something like a montage. So Paul Robeson is singing The House I Live In, My Neighbors White and Black, The People Who Just Came Here and Generations Back, A Home for All God's Children, That's America to Me. And in the background, you see um, him being uh, ratted out by uh, Jackie Robinson and being uh, met by furious anti-communists at the airport and his uh, his sons being married their, their procession being broken up by by anti-semites and you see the beginning of that the peak skill riot the people getting beaten up and their cars being windows being broken mm -hmm. august 1949 paul tried to give a concert in peak a blue-collar town north of new york city the american legion 
Chamber of Commerce and church groups mobilized to attack. Ropes and fans were pulled from their cars and beaten. A dozen ended up in the hospital. Police stood by and did nothing. So I would have done more, but I was in that sort of compressed. This was I think it mostly worked out though, because it kind of made it more dramatic toward the end <laughs> that I had to cram so much into a small space. Uh, the big skill is that was definitely a, a redneck town of sorts. I mean, Mel Gibson was born here. So that's enough said. Yeah. He was really the, the center of a lot of violence and discrimination at that point. He went from being, you know, a star to everyone to being everybody's enemy. You'll have to read the book. Get it from the, I think you can get it from some libraries. I hope. Any other questions? Comments? So I'm actually going to question myself. This is about my third interview on this. And all the time I was working on it, what I was most concerned about is what people would say, and especially after the stuff this summer, what people would say about why is a white artist doing a book about a black historical figure? What gives me the right to do this? How dare I do this? And have I done it? Have I done a decent job? And, you know, I, I question myself and I don't really have an answer except that I, I gave it all I had. I gave it the best I had. But I'm still not sure but that it wouldn't have been even better if a, if a black artist could have done it. Uh, but I'm, I'm actually sort of surprised. And I, I guess it's also significant, almost all the audiences that have had for interviews so far have been all white. So I wonder if there's less interest in the black community in Paul Robeson or if we've somehow ended up in some sort of segregated graphic artist ghetto where, you know, we can, we can think about something like this, but we're not really reaching the people we should be reaching. Does anyone have any reaction or comment about that? I don't know. Uh, yeah, Paul would probably have some something to say about that. Um, well, he almost gave me a job doing something about W.E.B. -E du Bois last spring, and I said, no, this time you have to get a Black artist. I won't, I won't take the work away from a Black artist. But yeah. the Paul Robeson, I really wanted to do it. And I, I guess my other excuse is that, that Paul Robeson was such an internationalist and supported all oppressed people and had a weakness for little old Jewish ladies. He had a lot of little old Jewish lady friends at Sands. And Jews used to call him our Paul because he was so supportive during the anti-Semitism of the period. So I excuse myself, but I still feel, I feel like if there's one question, I'm surprised I'm not being questioned about that's the one yeah right right yeah and paul mentioned he, uh, i think he found someone to work on the uh, the w.e.d du bois yeah um, i gave yeah. some idea no, at some point it's a matter of just the work the work should be given to someone who's not going to have the opportunity otherwise right right so um uh I mean, Emma Goldman, time. obviously, I'm the person that should do Emma Goldman in every way. There's no question about it. But, but some, some people, um, it's not really, shouldn't be my job. But I did the best I could do. I gave it my best. And, oh, and, and I, tried to, I tried to not, uh, okay, so this, I just want to tell you one little anecdote about my figuring out how I could do it. We did have an Africana Studies professor that was supposed to be like looking at it, making sure we didn't do anything awful. But he really didn't do very much, but... but um, stand back and um, put his name on it so that in case we, we got attacked, it would, it, would, it would be helpful. And it was, it could be very helpful. But when it, when it came to um, Paul Robeson playing Othello, um, I, let's see if I can find that. Because I changed the wording in a way that I think, I'm, I'm pleased with myself how I, how I made that decision. And I, and I wanted to explain that. Give me, bear with me just a minute here where I try to find the place. Oh, I'm not finding the place. But anyway, when he did Othello, he had done some of these really awful plays that had black characters, but were very stereotyped and very idiotic by Eugene O'Neill and other, you know, supposedly artistic um, white writers of the early 20th century. And when he did Othello, I, I was writing um, that Othello was a much more believable black character than anyone written by, by authors in the 20th century. And 
um, when I first wrote that line, I wrote something like he was he was a, a more realistic black character, and then I realized I don't have the right to say that, so I changed the wording to something like a more convincing black character or a more believable black character. I I tried to make it that. I wasn't taking territory that I didn't have any right to, ta to, to take as far as explaining the character of Othello. I couldn't say that he was a realistic black character, so I didn't have the right to say that, but I could say that it was more convincing to me. So I tried to step back and do that in my wording in a number of places, but I still, I would love, I wish some of you were black and could hold me up to account or tell me that I did okay. I still feel that that's something I need to hear from somebody. Right. Uh, Amy had a comment about this question. Let me see if I can unmute her. Um, are you there, Amy? Well, I mean, I, I agree with you. And then in another group, undoubtedly, you would have been asked how you could possibly presume to write about a man, a black man, a singer, unless you're a singer, et cetera, et cetera, and of the same species. And, uh, and it's a larger question, which comes up all the time now, as you know, uh, especially yeah. among um, like a generation that's coming up now. And I do think it's awfully short-sighted. Um, I, I do art history and I've come to um, places now where people stand up, art historians, and say, first a self-declaration, I am a 30-year-old gay white male and therefore I have this to say, which, which is really um, comes up a lot now sort of self-avowal of whatever and declaring that that privileges me to write about X but not Y or whatever. Well, well I, I think don't know if you want to talk about it further. What? I think in some cases it's maybe with the bathwater that did you go to too far. Uh, what I always bring up in that case is well, what about all these um, Christian artists that did, did this dead Jewish man on a, on, a, on a cross, you know, that if we're going to throw those all out, I mean, so that obviously we have a right to take an interest in other people than our own, other experiences than our own experiences. But I think the question is when our experiences are appropriated completely by some other group of people, so they're only seen from some completely different point of view. I mean, like the female characters, I decided at a really early point in my life that if I didn't read books that had anti-Semitism or, or didn't understand women or in general, that I, would, I wouldn't be able to read Tolstoy, I wouldn't be able to read Dickens. You know, I'd be cheating myself, I'd be cutting off my nose to spite my face. But I mean, think about it, characters like Natasha are so much not real females. I mean, there isn't a real female in literature until pretty recently, so except by a few women authors. So, you know, that it's to find the right middle ground where we can learn from each other's experience and filter th through our own experience in a, in a way that's generous and fair. I, we have a long way to go, but I, I, don't, I think it's a process that people need to go through. So is that your answer to when, because this comes a standard question now, does it not? No. Well, I, th I feel like it's already easing up just a little bit as far as what I, what I see in here, at least in criticism. But maybe what I see in here when I read a movie review or, or a book review, is it's all by still the same narrow group of people that just throw words around to sound like they're, they're being more considerate. I don't really know. I don't really know. It's an open question to me. I've, I grew up in Virginia and Maryland, and I don't feel that I've entirely overcome the racism I grew up with yet. Um, it wasn't given to me to be a completely free of stereotypes. I grew up in segregation as a Jew. But what it was given to me is to see when something was unfair and unjust. When I saw, I was still in single digits when I saw the water fountain that was all corroded and dirty and yucky for bits had colored and the nice water fountain for, for white children. And, you know, I can still remember the outrage I felt. Uh, I, 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 that's a beacon, you know, but, but through the working for Obama and then through what's happening now, I still find layers of stereotypes and racism being peeled off in my own heart. So I can only assume that everybody else that's making the effort is going through a similar process. We, we all grow up with our own, with our own groups and our own, you know, spectacles that make certain things seem normal and other things seem outside the norm. There's a lot, we all have a lot to learn. But, but I think Robeson was very open-hearted and wanted to, he very much saw that he was fighting with everybody. And, and, and that's, I mean, that, that would be a wonderful message for people to take from the book if they can take that from the book. I guess that's what the Welsh miners were all about to me. That being black isn't just a matter of being black. That, that you know, 
if people can take advantage of your labor and, and impoverish your children and cripple your life, you know, you can be, you can be made black. And, 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 and that's, we have to fight against the forces that do that, that profit from that. I have a question, which is, what kind of institutional support do you get in Los Angeles? For example, the Center for Political Graphics. Do you, do you work at all with the Center for Political Graphics? One time when I was at a demonstration with a, a hand-drawn poster, um, someone from them came up to me, but they never followed up on it, and I, I haven't been involved with them. They do great work, though, and their exhibits are wonderful, but I actually haven't been involved with them at all. If you have any connection with them, please put them in touch with me. I love their work. Okay. Are there other places that are like home, cultural or institutional homes for you? Uh, yeah. Community colleges or state universities? Every I'm just sequestered like everyone else. Yeah. Well, I really have They're missing fun. something. They're, they're missing something. <laughs> well, you can put the, oh, you're all welcome to put anybody in touch with me that might be interested. Okay. Okay, if, if we can We get, used to have okay. a group, we had, I'm sorry, um, uh, what's it called? The, you, during the uh, anti-Iraq war demonstrations, there was a group, ANSWER, the ANSWER group. They had a headquarters and they organized demonstrations and I worked with them. But as far as I know, there isn't even anything like that now. Uh, I, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be an old fogey and, and make a complaint here. Uh, since Occupy, there's this idea that there aren't supposed to be leaders, there aren't supposed to be organizations, and all decisions are supposed to be made by consensus. It's a wonderful idea. But uh, you know, if we really want to accomplish anything in an organ, I think you have people have to be willing to organize, and they have to be willing to have leaders, at least temporary leaders, that they can get rid of if they don't like them. But you you can't really press back against the power uh, that's that's oppressing us by by going about it that way. I, I think it's a failure. What what about the motion picture industry? Do you have any? Links. No connections whatsoever. Oh, and somebody recently wanted to film me for a documentary about underground comics, and I didn't want to let them in the house because of the plague. So I actually filmed myself, which was kind of fun. But as far as I know, it doesn't, it doesn't come out yet. I have no connections. <laughs> I sit here and draw. I'm a monk. It's fine. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't want to catch the plague either, so it's like fine to be isolated. When I get vaccinated, I'll go out more. <laughs> well, what would your what would your next ideal um, project be, assignment be? I'm really enjoying working on the William Morris illustrations, and I'm working on them at a very <clears throat> different deadline than I ever had before. I'm giving myself a month per page, and they're full color, so that'll get me through to. Oh, when will that get me through to? Next, next summer anyways. And um, I'm 73 now. I don't know how much more, more work I'd actually be ready to do at that point. I'm not sure I'd want to do another full book all by myself. So probably something working with other people so I didn't have to do a full book by myself would be, would be ideal. Thank you. Of a progressive nature. I work for the new Revolutionary Council that takes over after the uh, pandemic sweeps away the old nexus of power. I'll be I'll be uh, on call by the Minister of Culture. <laughs> You're all safe. I won't put you in re-education camps where you'll have to read underground comics and take drugs. You're lucky. I'll take down your names and keep you safe. No, I don't think anything like that's going to happen. I don't think Biden's going to lead any kind of a radical change in our lives. I'm afraid. I, I could see him doing something like the Works Projects Administration. I would have loved that. I mean, I, I could see the Biden administration. Oh, you think he might? Doing something like that. That would be great. That would be wonderful. Well, maybe you could start in Los Angeles. <laughs> I'm up to that. That sounds great. So what do you guys think, though, as far as all that goes? you think that transition is going to go smoothly, or do you think Trump's going to manage to kick up more fuss? Which, which part? <laughs> which, what, what are the choices? <laughs> well, do you, do you think that the, the, the huge number of people in the country now that are saying they, they think Trump is still the president, do you think we're going to have some sort of a, I mean, a lack? I think it's a horrible situation. I think that every day he undermines democracy 
it takes another yard off the football field. And uh, it, it, it's, it, uh, and you can just see it in, the, in the, this move to OAN. We're going to love Fox in retrospect. It's going to be our, our favorite uh, broadcaster. So I, I'm, I'm quite worried about it. And uh, I yeah. think it could be violence and a whole lot of other things. Yeah. But you can chronicle it. That's, that's <laughs> the good part. <laughs> Journal of the Plague Year. And I don't know if you're, you're in Southern California, right? I'm in Los Angeles and Hollywood, actually, yeah. Yeah, and I don't know if the. Um, the outlook in Los Angeles is different from that in New York, and I don't know where some of you, as you said, were upstate in city versus country in terms of uh, the, you know, sequestering yourself from the violence or whatever is happening. So, demographically, uh, I think different reactions from different places. Yeah. Well, I, I California seceding or, or seceding with Oregon and Washington seem to be ideas that keep coming up in the progressive community out here, but I don't know if there's any chance of it actually happening. They're well, actually being a, a... You can chronicle it. Huh? You can chronicle it. And what is the... Um, what names are they going to call this new tri-state um, yes. area? I don't know. There was a novel about that, Echotopia. Back in okay. the 70s, I think, about this, those states leaving the United States. That's what they called it, I think. Echo, Echo what? Topia. Echotopia. Oh, Echotopia. That's what they called it in the book, I think. Well, we have we have rednecks and, and right wing people and red cap people that don't want to wear masks and stuff, too. Along the coast, not so much. There's a question from uh, Bob Sikoriak. Hold on. Go ahead. Oh, Bob, wait. Yes, hi. Thank you so much for doing this. This was great. Um, Thank you. I, uh, I was curious. You, I love seeing how you talked about the entire history of, of art that influenced you. Um, and there were so many great people there. And I'm thinking about like your experience from underground comics to what's happening in comics now. Can you, can you kind of talk about how that evolution was for you in terms of the way like the possibilities of comics have opened up? Well, I'm afraid I really have to say I have not kept up with what's happened in recent decades. I knew Art Spiegelman uh, as one of the gang of people that lived in San Francisco when I lived in San Francisco. And in fact, I remember him telling me, if you're gonna draw buildings, you have to use a straight edge. So, which I, I remember now. Um, and he was actually already working on a short story that became part, of, that was the, the germ for Mouse. But everything post mouse, I really haven't. I haven't followed in any detail. I'm ashamed to admit. I'm, I sit around the house reading Zola and stuff, you know. So, Somerset Maugham. Somerset. I will commence if the play continues. Somerset Maugham is the best companion for a play you can possibly imagine. I mean, urbane, funny, entertaining. Uh, it's it really is a. And the stories are short enough you can go through them and then go back to whatever you have to do. So I, I actually am not a good person to ask about that. That Karen. I do. I do remember there was a time when the New York Times uh, finally started running some comics, and to me it was really funny because the comics had to be meaningless and 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 psychological and and empty of any. Uh, commitment to anything for them to New York Times to vet them that they were okay to have those comics in New York Times. And I guess the cartoonists weren't able to keep it up because they didn't print comics for very long and they stopped with that. Can I follow up with one, with one question? Um, yeah. I was actually curious about, for you, how, how the experience was because it seems like you have done so many things. So not maybe so much about the history just generally, but like your experience and like how your career has moved over time. Like well, I think I have learned to draw better, and that's really, really, really important to me. Um, I always try to push myself, and when you push yourself, you really can learn new things. You can see new things. Even though my vision physically is getting worse, I feel like I can, I can see more. Um, I just, I'm always, when I don't have work to do, then I'm always scrabbling around, just like some hungry little animal in the, in the forest floor, looking for somebody that'll give me a deadline. I, I'm not that good at motivating myself. I actually do need deadlines and structure and pages and panels and some things I have to do. I'm not someone that could just say, yes, I'm going to paint, you know, the ocean thing. But you know, the more you learn about the history of art, not that many of the really good people were just doing that either. They were getting commissions or they were working for the church or they were trying to had to sell their seascapes or whatever. I mean, 
being being connected with reality, I don't view as a bad thing. I don't feel that being an artist means you're supposed to be disconnected from the, the reality of in fact, I guess that's a good thing since we have extra time anyway, to say why I love my profession, even if I haven't made much of a living at it. I love the connection to reality. I love that when I'm when I'm working on something, I'll just be walking around and I'll say, that cloud, I want that cloud, I'm gonna steal that cloud. Oh, that tree, that tree is useful. Oh, look at I need a car, that's a good car. It's it's like going to the flea market. Oh, I don't even have to spend as much money as you spend at the flea market. Everything's there. And and my and my view on art, other people's art, not the stuff I showed you today, but in more recent years, is uh, I, because there's so much of it, and it's also different. It's is there anything here I can steal? You know, I don't say it's good art or bad art. Is there anything here I can steal? And if there's something I can steal, I look at it and I steal it. I don't even have to get my fingers dirty, or I just look at it and try to figure out what is it, what it, what is there in it that I want to steal? They they had a banners up for some exhibit at the art museum. I don't remember whether Rubens or remember somebody wonderful, and it was a child's a profile of a child's head, and there was this ear. And every time I'd walk back and forth in the grocery store, I'd just stand there, and you know, I wanted to steal that ear. I wanted that ear, and I, I didn't try. I just memorized it, and and I think it did. I, I'm not saying I could ever draw the ear as well as whoever this was, but I was able to incorporate some of what made it so theft worthy. Uh, so that that's my attitude towards art, in a nutshell. Now. <laughs> now that I'm good enough to steal. When I was a, when I was younger and admiring all those things I showed you, I wasn't a good enough artist to steal from them yet. Now I'm a good enough artist I can steal from almost anybody. So that's my, the progress of my career. Mm -hmm. How about you, Ben? What, what motivates you as an artist? What, 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 what motivates you as an artist? Uh, well, at some point when I could make a living doing it, that uh, motivated me. I said, this is too good a way to make a living to stop doing it. So that's, you know, that's the um, uh, materialist uh, motivation. But um, yeah, but other than that, just, well, if you can find an audience, um, I, I was in newspapers for a while and that was a big motivation to know that people we're waiting for my next strip. I mean, I don't think I've, I think that's getting harder to figure out what, where an audience is and because it's so spread out now online. But, um, but that was, yeah, that was it. Those two things, people waiting for my next story. That's a very good point. Because when I first worked in underground newspapers, that was the really exciting thing to walk down the street in Madison and people would be buying the paper and looking at our work the next day. That was very, very motivating. So mm -hmm. I, I agree with you about that. Yeah, I think that generation of that, those 60s underground cartoonists really um, wanted that idea of a, you know, a, la a large readership to reproduction. And uh, I mean, that's, uh, that's what drove me to want to do it. And you know, to specifically not to be making pictures for, uh, for walls or galleries, but for reproduction. Yes, yes. You're absolutely right. That's really true. Yeah, I, I liken it to the insect strategy as opposed to the mammal strategy. You have lots and lots of, of young and most of them die, but there's so many of them, some of them will survive. <laughs> Whereas if you make a, a great sculpture out of stone or a great oil painting, you know, it just takes one house fire or, or one rich person that turns it around to the wall and no one will ever see it again. But if you get printed on newsprint and hand it out at demonstrations, lots and lots of people will keep what you did alive. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, and uh, these these history comics you've done, I mean, would you have been capable of doing the research for uh, these books, or did you need to work? Feel you needed to work with a writer or his? No, I do all my own writing and research. Oh, so they just so, add. They just yeah, what I. And in fact, one of the backhanded compliments that I'm proudest of is uh, the Lincoln book. It was, um, we, the preference was by this Pulitzer Prize winning Lincoln scholar, Eric Foner. And he just assumed that what I had written had been written by Paul Bull. He, he knew no cartoonist could possibly have written it. I, I took that as a great compliment, never corrected him. I like stuff like that. Mm -hmm. 
That's funny. I, 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 right, they ju they're just your, they edited, edited the book. Yeah. No, I mean, being too smart for my own good is also, I, at this point in my life, I can admit it. So what I do use is all the different parts of me that just caused trouble when before I found a way to, to use them. That's how I look at it. <laughs> right. I mean, I found a medium that works for me, so I'm not going to give it up. Even if everybody else gives it up, I'm going to keep doing it. No, no, I think there's a new golden age of comics. There are more people making them than ever. I mean, that part of that has to do with the fact that they're taught in universities now. Back in the 60s, I mean, people would probably think it was a career suicide to say, I want to be a, especially an, alter, an underground cartoonist, you know, you're just leaving the, uh, the middle class behind. So uh, that's changed completely. Um, I don't know whether for the better or but it's changed that um, but what do you think everything going online and content being free and everything that 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 it's i'm getting too old to have to worry about it but that's really changing the medium right do you think uh yeah it's um i i think across all all fields of um writing and uh you know, except for people who are making things that you have to supposedly have the material object, like a storm window or a, you know, a, a sculpture who makes something where you, somebody may want the, they don't want to look at a photograph, but for the kind of work that's um, reproducible, like text, journalists and cartoonists, um, I think yeah, they're in the middle of reinventing how this can work for people. Yes. Uh, the, the whole the economics of it. You know, a lot of people moving to these newsletter uh, formats again and, um, and looking for, uh, you know, the oldest form, the subsidy, uh, working, being subsidized directly by your readers. So all the middle people are cut out, you know the publishers, the editors, the printers, the binders, the truckers. I mean, the so uh, yeah, the bookstores. So, uh, you know, that's part of it. Um, but I think, um, I think it's a very different kind of cultural setup. It's more like um, a village setup where maybe you'll find a few hundred people you won't need thousands of people. And maybe if a few hundred people can subsidize a writer or a, a cartoonist, it would work. But it's not, it's on a very different scale than, uh, you know, mass media, mass publishing. I mean, then it's not driven by advertisements. It doesn't have to be, but, uh, People, the only, the only people who figured out how to make this work are the aggregators like Facebook and, and Google who uh, can sell all this data. But, um, and you know, Amazon. But, uh, but I don't know that it's um, how it'll work for individuals trying to uh, make a living with this work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's what students are thinking about, well, having all the time, how this all, how you find your readership. And is that readership too busy looking at something else to, you know, devote the kind of um, support that a, uh, a, a patron would offer? Yeah, I mean, even if it's, 50, you know, $50 a year is what some of these subscription services are asking. Which, well, I think we are reaching a paradigm shift as far as this kind of print print media. But you something my again one of my kids actually pointed out to me is that the golden age of Greek drama only lasted like one generation. You know, the golden age of the novel, I mean, lasted what a hundred years. I mean the gold these broke music, you know, how long so I mean, maybe comics reached various kinds of peaks and maybe the kind of comics we know is on the is on the way out, but we were lucky enough to participate in it, you know, in our lifetimes and take oh. it take the ride as far as it went 
Well, no, people are making them. I don't. I think you meet young cartoonists now who don't think about it as a way to make a living. They make it like you know the uh, the sweatshop poet who worked during the day and then at night wrote poetry. So yeah, but yeah. that's uh, I don't know um, that that's physically sustainable. But uh, let's see, maybe. Something will. Uh, well, maybe the the uh, person in that said we'll have a WPA, maybe a, a WPA type cultural. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think if this, this, you know, government makes a WPA, they'll try to privatize it and have it run by. Yeah, I can't imagine a real WPA. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, everything else about this, this government is not. Uh, it's about privatization, so why? Yeah, yeah. I mean, people were talking about, you know, the Green New Deal, well, even that, if it ever would happen, would be run by private companies, not by. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that. Um, the other, early on, on, when the internet began, people were talking about micropayments so that if using Facebook, posting on Facebook should pay you something. And if you, you know, but that all boils down to these, um, you know, these machines like the mechanical yeah. perk, they're these kind of very low paying uh, systems now online where you can do work for somebody. And if you do enough of it over a year, you might make some money. Well, with enough global warming and plagues and so forth, we go back to painting on walls again. <laughs> Being what again? The drawing on the cave walls again. We'll go back oh. to the red stuff. Yeah, well, yeah, well, that's the cottage, you know, the, the village uh, system of whether if a small group of people need their local cartoonists and they're willing to support them. That may be what the future holds for us. Yeah. I, have to, I have to call it an evening. Oh, right? okay. Thank did we you. do enough? Is this good? What is that? Oh, did we do enough? Do we need yes, to do yes. We, we should dance and you, sing. Uh, no, we're all right. All right. So Any you. last questions or comments or anything? Everybody's okay. Thank you all for joining. It was really fun. I really appreciate your attention and um, keep reading comics. Thank, Thank you, you. Ben. Yeah.